I think SummerSlam is representative of a lot of big WWE shows in this way. You get some good, you get some real highlights, some good matches. Then you get quite a bit of stuff that you're like, A, this feels like this could have just been on TV and I wouldn't be missing anything. Or B, you won't even really remember what happened 24 hours later, let alone a week later. And then you get some really dumb, puzzling, stupid, booking, creative decisions that make you go, what the hell are you doing? And it makes you want to say, hashtag WWE ruins everything. I, I, I can't put the show any better than that. Like, that's the 30,000 foot high level overview of SummerSlam. Like, for example, who wasn't booked? Daniel Bryan, Braun Strowman, Drew McIntyre, Samoa Joe, Roman Reigns, all these guys that have been prominently featured on WWE TV for the past several months are nowhere to be on your biggest card of the summer? Like, who, who, who decides this crap? Why would you waste all this television time on these guys for them to not even appear, let alone wrestle? That just blows my mind. And especially I look at like Roman Reigns, and sure, I understand kind of what the you're doing with the angle, but at the same point in time, this is a guy that you've put so much behind. He's healthy, he's there, and you don't have him booked on your biggest show of the summer in any way? Imagine doing that back in the day with John Cena. If Cena was healthy, he was probably main eventing fucking SummerSlam. In this case, Roman Reigns isn't even on the damn show. That's crazy. Who made that decision? Anyways, when you get onto the actual show, like I said, it's kind of a yo-yo. Just up and down, up and down, up and down. Quite a bit in the middle, too. Uh, the Raw Women's Championship, Natalia Becky Lynch. I'm recording this on Monday morning early, just woke up, and the reality is, is I can't remember anything about this match. I, I didn't take any notes intentionally because I wanted to see, like, when I woke up the next morning, what did I actually remember? What truly stood out, not just me taking notes and reminding myself of what happened. I really don't remember much of anything other than they probably went a little too far with the submission stuff and got a little hokey at times. It was maybe okay, but it's, again, nothing I even remember the next morning. But I will tell you what I will remember for a long, long time to come. Goldberg. 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 Bury his ass. Goldberg. Spear him again. Goldberg. Send him back into oblivion. That was great. It's fucking epic. If you don't like it, you can eat shit. what I needed. This, this is what I wanted. This, this was what I was craving. Was to take that wannabe, never has been, never will be, and bury his ass in front of a whole world to see at SummerSlam. Goldberg looked great. Let's not reinvent the wheel. Keep it short, sweet, and to the point. And squash that wannabe, never has been, never will be, back into oblivion. Go, is that back? I'm back. Goldberg speared his ass. Goldberg came out for some more. Goldberg, he did it again. <coughs> Fuck the Ziggler, ha <laughs> ha. Don't ask for a ton nowadays, because God knows I'm not going to get it. But Goldberg doing that? That felt good. That felt really, really good. There was a little adrenaline shot when I needed it early on in the night. The United States Championship match. Ricochet, AJ Styles. I saw somebody on Twitter say that this was reminding them of Styles and Nakamura. Matches that you had high expectations for, you thought were going to be a whole lot better than what they ultimately were. If that's not a great comparison for this, I don't know what is. This is one of these things that, like I said, Sim, to the Raw Women's Championship match the next morning, I really don't remember anything that happened. I really don't. And it just leaves you wanting more. 
AJ hasn't been the same AJ over the past, I would say, probably year plus. He's just kind of good. He's not the phenomenal one right now. That's for damn sure. And Ricochet, I'm sorry, I'm still not buying it. What makes him so special? What makes him so different or so unique? And, and, and you really can't tell me what it is. Lots of guys do the same moves that he does. Lots of guys have the zero mic skills that he has. Lots of guys have the lack of personality that he does. He just blends into the crowd. He's just another dude. That's it. I mean, it's that simple. That's why I hate him, dude. I'm just, let's be realistic here. What is different? What is special about him? I don't know. Uh, I will not remember anything about this match. And the only thing I'll remember about the SmackDown Women's Championship match between Bailey and Ember Moon was just how much it sucked. Like, the girls tried in the sense of they tried to do a bunch of spots, but it was kind of like two people that don't really know what the hell they're doing in terms of actually working. So as a result, they just try to throw in a bunch of spots and try to pop the crowd, and it doesn't really work. There's no reason to be emotionally invested in Ember Moon for the Toronto audience, and it showed. There was no reason to be invested in any type of story here because there really wasn't any type of story here. It was just weird and odd in a lot of different ways. The match fell flat and went over like a fart in church. And that's about that. What more can you say? I will say the crowd did its best to try and help make Kevin Owens versus Shane McMahon really good. I mean, you, you use Elias there as that special enforcer. Hey, Shane's going to do whatever he can to try and win. The match was solid, not spectacular in my eyes. Again, the crowd felt like they were into it, which helped a little bit. But it's kind of one of these things. Like, you put yourself in this position. You can't really have Kevin Owens lose, can you? But if you have him win, what's next? And where, where, where's really the appeal here? Then on the flip side, why do all of this with Shane McMahon just to have him lose? Where's the appeal there? And some of you might say, well, getting Shane off of TV. But if he's right back on TV again on Tuesday or the next week, then what the hell was the point? Now, to me, the way you could have really made this interesting was to have Kevin Owens lose. And you could draw that storyline out for months because why the hell not? As a lot of people would accurately point out, when the WWE does crap like this, they can't help themselves, and they ruin it. And you're absolutely correct. They do. But what they've done here really doesn't help anything either. At least if you do that, you had a chance to do something interesting. Here, not so much. It's just, it's a match that happened at SummerSlam, and Kevin Owens wins. Yippee, skip, hooray. Which is what I basically thought I was going to say about Trish Stratus and Charlotte Flair. Uh, I was not looking forward to this match. I didn't want to see Trish in a position where she's going to work with Charlotte and have to job to Charlotte. Charlotte didn't fucking need it. It just didn't work for me, heading up into it. And then the match happened. And once this match got going, this match really, really got going. I will give a lot of credit to both of these ladies. Trish, even with the occasional moment of kind of awkward sloppiness... In general, she was really, really good. And you could see just how great of a performer she once was. It showed here. The facials that she... Uh, shut up, guys. Um, but the facial expressions, you know, kind of being like the anti Bret Hart. The way that she could connect with the crowd. Um, her moves have consequence. They have meaning. Just phenomenal stuff. And I'll say this for Charlotte this time is that she wasn't nearly the bocce bitch that I usually see her to be. In this particular case, you, you look at her and it's like she had to slow down and she had to take measure and time with everything that she did. And I felt like it really made the match. Instead of going out there and just bumping around all over the place with any random person, you know, there was actually an attempt to try and tell a story here. This match was outstanding. For not looking forward to it, going into it, and resenting the fact that Charlotte was going to go over Trish Stratus. Ultimately, this match was outstanding. And arguably the match of the night. It was a real surprise. And this is a match that I will remember for a long time to come. I will also remember the WWE Championship match for a long, long time to come. Oh, this match is the main event. This match should be the main event. That's what the fuck I get. That's what I get. 
You had 11 years of story, damn near 10 years worth of story here, and this is what the hell you do? This? 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 Not every match needs to have a clean finish. I am totally a proponent of that, especially if the not clean finish is well done and it works and advances a story. Kobe Kingston versus Randy Orton. If that was the bullshit that you were going to do, then it needed a clean finish. Either Kofi Kingston wins, I'd be okay with that. And believe it or not, Randy Orton wins, and I also would have been okay with that. I almost feel dirty saying that. Hashtag Breakfast Club rules, bitches. But there were so many ways you could have went with this. You could have had another stupid fucking stupid spot. This time, instead of Randy Orton being the one that pulls it, it's Kofi Kingston that does it. Like, let's say Orton botched an RKO and or, or Kofi hit him with a surprise trouble in paradise. Like, there were so many things and so many possibilities for this match. I couldn't be the only one that was really looking forward to this and ultimately felt like they got kicked square in the testicles. Or if you're a woman, you got kicked square in the tay-tay. The hell was this? Who books this crap? And having Kofi go off just because Orton looked at his family. It would be one thing if Orton went up there and tried to make moves on his wife. And he tried to sit there and say, you can call me daddy now. Ugh. None of that happened. He just fucking looked at him. Like they were regular fans. And Kofi's going to fly out the handle like this. And it just, and as I saw somebody talking about, several people talking about, they just basically lifted an AJ versus Joe a finish from last year. That's exactly what they did. And it fucking didn't work then. And it didn't work now. What a fucking phenomenal disappointment this was. Fuck this. At this point in time, I was like, the WWE Championship match, which was one of the two, or I should say three things I was looking forward to, along with Goldberg and along with what came next, was such a disappointment. Of course, they were going to sit there and have the Universal Championship main event because they're going to try and force this. They're going to try and fool you. I was like, I was ready to cash out on this show. And then we get The Fiend. My God. This was awesome. The remixed entrance music. I'm not the biggest music connoisseur or aficionado out there. But I do miss the days when wrestling theme songs were actually kick-ass. Because most of them are not anymore. To me... This theme song, comparative to what we see now, was hard-hitting. It fit the character. It was kick-ass. The entrance was kick-ass. That lantern of Bray Wyatt's head. You can put that on WWEShop.com, especially as you get closer to Halloween, and make a shit ton of money selling those damn things. The Fiend Mask, you could do the same damn thing. And just everything about this worked. The only complaint that I have is just one, is that Finn Balor got in any fucking offense at all. The hell with Finn Balor, he doesn't matter, he's irrelevant. Bray Wyatt, the fiend, what you saw here was the potential, the possibility to actually make a unique and interesting character that is so sorely missing in today's WWE. Like when you look at Finn Balor out there, and he was in his white trunks and he was just Twinkie, Calvin Klein-ish model, dude. You saw just how bland and vanilla wrestling is now. Like, he was the representation of it. And The Fiend is the representation of when wrestling is cool and what wrestling should be and what wrestling is supposed to be about. It's about personalities, it's about characters. It's about larger-than-life things. It's about those things that, even as ridiculous as they seem, make you suspend your disbelief just enough to be able to buy into and believe in them. Like you got Bray Wyatt sitting there pretending to snap the dude's fucking neck and hitting him with a mandible claw like this shit was awesome. And this is how he should be featured going forward. Fight the temptation to have him wrestle on Raw. Just don't do it. He appears every two, three weeks maybe. You do some of the Firefly Funhouse um, vignettes, whatever. You sit there and you have him win in similar fashion like this and just blow through people. You have him win the Royal Rumble. You have him go on and beat somebody at fucking WrestleMania for a world title. 
You want to get nuts? Let's get nuts. And this shit was nuts. Like, I could only imagine the joy of being in Toronto and experiencing that entrance live and in person. It was a highlight of the night. For one night at least, this did not disappoint. This was awesome. This was kick-ass. And now, like a lot of you, I wait to see how WWE is going to blow this and screw this up. Because the fact of the matter is, WWE deserves zero benefit of the doubt here in general. And specifically when it comes to Bray Wyatt. We've been here, we've done this, or similar stuff to this, and what have they ultimately done? Praying this time is different. Knowing it probably isn't. Which brings us to the main event. Nothing else factored in. This match between Rollins and Lesnar, removing any storytelling elements, removing anything else, was fucking awesome. I will take this match over stupid-ass Gargano and Cole's spot fest at NXT TakeOver any day of the damn week. You don't like it, that's just too damn bad. Like, this was outstanding as a match in a bubble in and of itself. It's always clear when Brock Lesnar gives a fuck. It's like Brock Lesnar was paid even more money to really give a fuck here because they were really trying to help Rollins. It's like they are trying to reset things with Rollins. In a bubble in and of itself, this match was outstanding. Seth Rollins wins. It was probably a legit surprise to a lot of people. Most certainly was me. And therein lies the issues here. So let me get this straight. This guy, now you had beat Lester at some at WrestleMania, and you put the strap on him for several months, and clearly it was too much for him. The pressure was getting to him. He was being an idiot on Twitter. His character was sucking on television. You decide the best way to give fans a break or to reset the character a little bit is by having him win the belt right back from fucking Lester at SummerSlam? Who's thinking of this crap? This is Randy Orton-esque. No matter what you're being told by the audience, no matter what your basic sense is telling you, you're going to force this crap and try to pound it down people's throats, eventually hoping it's going to work. And it's not. You've thrown a lot of crap at South Rollins over the years anyways, and look at where the hell you're at. And sure, the Toronto crowd was really behind him last night, but don't be fooled. That was one night. One night. That shit is not going to carry over. He's going to be every bit as fucking bland as he has been the past several months. I, I just don't get it. The dude has proven to you that he wasn't equipped to handle the spot. And if anything, he really needed a break, probably for a couple of months to reset and redo everything. And instead you go right back into it by having him win the fucking strap here? Like, why even bother having money in the bag just to have Lester cash in in Extreme Rules, just to sit there and have Rollins win it back at fucking SummerSlam. It's the epitome of WWE wasting everybody's damn time. Like, what the fuck? Unbelievable. And what's even more unbelievable and totally ridiculous about this is they now have Seth Rollins in the course of a year, the last two major pay-per-views, has beaten Brock Lesnar clean both times, but all this time Roman Reigns couldn't do it fucking what? What the hell's going on here? What the hell's the difference here? Does Roman Reigns need to start boning a fucking Nazi for people behind the scenes at WWE to give him a clean victory over Lesnar? And think about all the matches he had with Lesnar, and not once, not once, not once, did you ever go over 100% clean? What the fuck is the problem here? This is it because you're worried Roman's going to go off and make movies some days and you know that Seth Rollins isn't nearly talented enough to ever be a fucking Hollywood actor? So you think this son of a bitch is going to wrestle until he dies so we can build around him? Uh, oh my fucking God. Just dumb. And what's even as ridiculous, if not more so, is the fact that two weeks ago on Raw... Seth Rollins get the shit kicked out of him multiple damn times by Brock Lesnar. Comes back the next week on Raw, selling the injuries, almost looking ridiculous doing so, but to his credit, at least selling the injuries, and then he gets his shit pounded again. To then six days later, 
after two straight weeks of getting fucking rocked by Brock Lesnar, other than some damn rib tape and getting ragged all about it at one point, Seth Rollins isn't selling shit for fucking injuries. How about a little damn continuity here, people? Like, that makes no fucking sense. No sense. He gets his ass kicked, comes back the next week, sells injuries that are still lingering to get his ass kicked again to then six days later, it's like nothing ever happened. Continuity, damn it. Seth Rollins is not the universal champion we wanted by God. He's just the one we fucking got. You gotta give WWE credit for this, if nothing else. They're stubborn to the point of stupid. Oh, fucking lord. What a way to ruin the fucking night for me. <sighs> Anyways. I, I might just sound like an angry wrestling man, but... I mean, I I'm not wrong here, and you know I'm not. And OTR Essential here. Remember, not the wrestling show you want. Just the wrestling show you need. Let me know what you thought of SummerSlam in the comments below. Ugh. It didn't work the first time, so you're going to immediately fucking go back to it? Stupid!